So, you think that these these manuscripts are from the time of uh, Uthman, 652, mid 7th century, and then radiocarbon supports that? <laughs> Wait till you find what we have found. We're going to shut down specifically. We've already done it with the sauna. We're going to now do it with the tubing. And Wait till you see what we now know about the tubing. Today we're going to talk about another example of one of those early Quranic manuscripts known as the Tubigan Manuscript. The reason why we're bringing it up is because it was used also by a scholar by the name of uh, Mariam Van Putin, where he made reference to these uh, manuscripts to support one of his own discoveries. And of course, with me here to unpack all of this is our dear Dr. J. Smith. Dr. J., Welcome back. Good to be back again. Good to be talking about these manuscripts. Controversial, yes, they are controversial, but we need to really unpack them because the claims have been made, and we need to say, are those claims correct? So let's look at the tube again. I'm going to go ahead and put the slide up here. Uh, if you look at the slide, you will see these are just four folios from the Tübingen manuscript, which is in Germany. Now, in 2014, the University of Tübingen uh, announced the results of radiometric analysis of an early Quran in its library collection, which originally came from Damascus. A sample of this manuscript was analyzed by the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, in Switzerland, uh, which reported a greater than 95% probability that the animal from which this folio had been produced died sometime between 649 and 675. Well, if that is the case, if Muhammad died in 632, as Muslims believe, I don't believe that, you don't believe that, but as certainly as the standard Islamic narrative states, then you can see this is very close. And this is also within the range of 652 where the Uthmanic recension right. would have been uh, written. So this manuscript had previously been dated by experts on the basis of paleography and format as most likely having been written in the early 8th century. So this puts it back a, a good 50 years. And you know what's so interesting is I've, I've been looking at the upper layer of the Sana manuscript for a while and this almost looks the same just from a distance. Absolutely. Yeah. That's going to come into play. Yeah. So is it 649 to 675, which would fit the Noldeki Shwali paradigm, or is it later on in the 8th century, the 705 to 720, which would fit perfectly with Abdul Malik and Ahal Jaj paradigm? Let's see what the scholars say. So let's go to the next slide, and you can see here you go, Shoemaker. And his, his he comes back and says, Hold on a minute. We're again, we're having the same problem again. We're just using one lab. Remember with Asana? Once they went to three other labs, you came up with four different, uh, four different dates that actually contradicted the laboratory in Arizona by hundreds of years in some cases, all the way back to 388, the fourth century. So we got to do the same thing with the Tubigen lab. Mm -hmm. This was far too simplistic, Shoemaker say, of an analysis to rely on the results of a single dating from a single lab while completely discounting the evidence for dating the manuscript based on its script and analysis. Therefore, what, according to him, and, and also uh, Fideli and Sellard, they came up and they said, look at other manuscripts. Look and see if there's, if there's similarities. So let's see what Fideli and, and uh, Sellard said. This is what they said. Radiocarbon dating is often assumed to possess a sort of supremacy that authorizes the acceptance of its result separate from other methods of relative dating. And this is exactly what Van Putin has done. He just puts it out there. It's scientific. We trust science. Therefore, let's go with the dating and no questions asked, almost hoping that no other questions are asking. Well, Fideli and Sellar say, no, you cannot do that. So they, let's continue. They say, consequently, the notion of the dating of the parchment has completely been superimposed upon the dating of the text. In this replacement process, no reference has been proposed to the type of script and letter shapes of the text itself or a comparison to contemporary dated documents which exhibit similar features. Now, al Fadi, you know and I know that the scripts change in every language, in every text, in every script. We do, even in English. If you look at an archaic or a book that was written maybe 100, 100 to, to, maybe let's say 200 years ago, you'll see a letter F, and that's an S letter. Right. We don't, F today is a F letter. It's, it's like Finnish, but it's not an S letter today. So already you can see, even in English, we can see that. Why in the world aren't we doing the same thing with Arabic? 
And so yeah. that's why they're saying, go back to other manuscripts, look and see how the orthography changes, look and see how the script changes, and you get a better picture of what we're talking about. That is true. So Shoemaker says that radiocarbon date, uh, 14 dating, only the it only dates the parchment. We've said this so many times before, but it does not date the ink. The radiocarbon dates only tell us when the animal died, reminds him to us of that. Not with the ink which applied to the parchment. Unwritten leaves could sit in storage for generations, let alone decades before their use, especially if you didn't make the parchment to begin with which the Arabs had not been making these parchments. They grabbed them. They took them from the Christians. Sometimes they bought them. Some they took, sometimes they took them in rage. Uh, obviously, the Christians had them for other uh, use because they wanted to use them for the biblical text. The Arabs were now taking them. They were using them for their own. And, of course, it, it makes sense now. While at this time, um, um, uh, beginning of the 8th century, Abdul Malik uh, and Al-Hajjaj would have been taking these parchments and writing their own script from those parchments. Uh, Shoemaker then continues, and he talks about the fact that when you look at the dots, when you look at the vowelizations, you need to then date it from that. The ornamentation on the manuscript with dots punctuating divisions between the verses as well as hollow red circles. Now, that's the first part. Remember, that even changed. So when you have hollow circles and when you have three dots, that is the earlier punctuation mark. Those are usually between verses, and they're also vowelization. That then got changed later on to having slashes, curlicues, and dots of three above right. and three below, which started in the 8th and 9th century. And by the way, people can look at some of these early manuscripts. It's it's even clear to the naked eye that something was added on top of a letter or close to a word. If you were doing it while you're writing, you will space it out. Yes, and you will see even a different color. In right. the case of the topkapa that we're going to get that we talked about right. earlier, the topkapa has red dots, proving that these are probably lighted at a at a later date. So these hollow red circles, he says, surrounded by dots at every tenth verse and a series of triangular dots filling the line to the margin to mark the end of the surahs does not look what, like what we would expect from one of the first attempts at the Quran into writing, certainly not in the mid-7th century. This is from the 8th century, is what he is saying. So, stylistically, it's early 8th century made to compete with a Christian text. Doroche brings us up, Salad brings us up. Why are they doing this? Why the stylization? What's going on? because they're trying to compete with the Christian text. They're trying to compete with the Byzantine Christians who ha or, or have the standard text. You now are introducing your Quran, you're introducing from your prophetic line, you want to be able to have that which is equal to theirs. So this is what they say. On the basis of the page layout, illuminations, paleography, and other markers from the pro production of the text on the page, this parallels a larger group of manuscripts produced in the end of the 7th century and the beginning of the 8th century under the official state patronage of the imperial court. The ornamentation and style of these manuscripts reflect the campaign initiated by Abdul al-Malik and al-Hajjaj to establish a new distinctively Islamic Arabic scripture to suppress or surpass the scriptures of the Christians and Jews. Uh, I, I will disagree with just one part of that, but you'll see why later. These elements of ornamentation in the early codices were intended to rival the luxury Bibles of the Christians in appearance. Now, this is Doro saying this. This is Salard, his student. Remember, these are the top in the world today. They're, they're putting it in a historical context. You've got to see that there was a competition going on. And this competition demanded that they had this stylized, beautiful stylization, which is what we're seeing in the Tubingen manuscript. Uh, Fideli and Shoemaker then say that you look at these similar Qurans, we said that earlier, it remains the fact that the form of the text as written on the Tubingen parchment corresponds with other Qurans from the early 8th century, which bear the hallmarks of production under the imperial auspices, or the imperial auspices means Abdul Malik and Al-Hajjaj, who is his governor. Three reasons the Tubingen manuscripts not, is not from the 7th century, but from the 8th century. Number one, the dots in the circular verse marking suggest a much more stylized and thus later text. Number two, the page layout, the illuminations, the paleography parallels other 8th century manuscripts. Number three, ornamentations reflect Abdul Malik's and al Hajjaj's new distinctively Islamic and Arabic texts, which they hoped would surpass Christian manuscripts from that time. And that's why we need to go back, we need to ask this question, and that's why we need to go back and look and see what the scholars are saying. I don't want to come up with my own suppositions. These are the scholars who have worked on these manuscripts for, well, their whole careers. Who am I to question them? 
But I would love to see what Pan, Van Putin's going to say because Van Putin's going to have to answer this. He's going to have to look at the paleographical material. None of this, none of these dots and vowels, none of this ornamentation exists in the mid seventh century. We don't even have much of a script in the early uh, mid seventh century. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the eighth century, but not fifty to sixty years earlier. Yeah, and um, uh, certainly it will be interested, uh, interesting to take a look at those. And uh, and and I agree, of course, with some of the stuff that uh, uh, Derouge and Szilard have have been saying because you have to really wonder. Where did these styles of ornamentation, and some of them look really beautiful, even though you would look at the orthography and the paleography of the manuscript, and it looks a little bit aged compared to the beauty of these ornamentations. So that tells me, uh, as they stated it correctly, it's been borrowed at a certain time. Okay. Yeah. Now we're going to get in some heavy material. This is the exciting stuff coming up. You ready? Very good. Now we're going to ask, this is where sh I love Shoemaker. This is what he does. However, he does make a huge glaring mistake. We're going to get to that later. He is now going to ask the question that everybody should be asking. If this Quran comes from Mecca and Medina, what's happening in Mecca and Medina? What exactly is going on down there? Could those two cities in that place have accommodated the Quran that we have today? Wonderful. And, and of course, I mean, who knows? Maybe he didn't think about that particular question for whatever reason. Maybe he focuses effort on whatever he's producing, but it's good to address things like this. Thank you everyone for joining us. Until next episode, this is Al Fadi, over and out. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.